Uh, I think we're gonna get, I think we're gonna get started. Um, thank you all for coming. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center, International Center for Scholars. Um, my name is Mircea Montano. I'm the pro program associate um, here at the yeah. center. That's probably. Well, yeah. Well, it should be on. That's better. Um, anyway, I'm the program associate for the Center's Cold War International History Project. Um, those of you not familiar with the center, let me just say a couple of words. The center is the nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It's a nonpartisan institute for advanced study and neutral open forum for serious and informed dialogue. It brings preeminent thinkers to Washington for extended periods of time uh, to interact with policymakers through a large number of programs and projects. The center seeks to separate the um, important from the inconsequential and to take a historical and broad perspective on the issues. Um, within the center, the History and Public Policy Program and the Cold War International History Project um, support the full and prompt release of historical materials from all sides of the Cold War and seek to accelerate the um, process of integrating new sources, materials, and perspective from the former communist bloc with a histo uh, historiography of the Cold War. Uh, it seeks to transcend barriers of language and culture, geography, and regional uh, specialty to create new links among, um, to, to, sorry, I, more than that, I, I'm not really sure what I can do, uh, to create new links among um, scholars interested in Cold War history. Among the many activities taken by, this, uh, by the, the project, it's the publication of the bulletin, copies of which are available outside, um, the publication of working papers, all of which are available on the website, um, international conferences um, and seminars and discussions on new and exciting um, um, the historiography, including uh, today's event. Uh, let me say a couple of words about the people on the panel, and then I'll, I'll uh, let Christopher take over. Christopher Bright is a scholar of the 20th century American political and diplomatic history and the author of uh, the book, which is the basis of today's discussion, Continental Defense in the Eisenhower Era, Nuclear Anti-Aircraft Arms in the Cold War. Uh, the book is available for purchase outside and at better stores around you. Um, an earlier version of the book formed the basis for uh, his PhD dissertation at George Washington University. Uh, his research has been supported by grants from the Smithsonian's Na uh, National Air and Space Museum, the Eisenhower Library, the U.S. Army Center of Military History, and others. He earned his Ph.D. Uh, from George Washington University in 2006 uh, and, hold, and holds an MPhil from GW uh, and an MA in Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. Commenting on um, the book is Robert Norris a senior research associate with the National Resource Defense Council, where he specializes in nuclear weapons. Norris has written and contributed to a number of books on U.S. nuclear history, including mo most recently U.S. Nuclear Arsenal, A History of Weapons and Delivery Systems Since 1945, as well as Racing for the Bomb, General Leslie Gro Groves, The Manhattan Project's Indispensable uh, Man. He earned his Ph.D. at New York University and has taught at NYU, Miami University in Ohio, as well as American University in Washington, D.C. Um, we're going to, um, Chris will take about 20 minutes describing uh, um, and, and discussing the book, and then um, um, uh, we're going to have comments from Robert Norris, and then we're going to open it up to uh, question and answers. Please wait for the microphone. Um, it's, a, it's a small room, and we can hear you, but it's not going to be picked up by the, uh, by the web stream, and um, that would be a shame. So thank you, Chris. All of you. Well, thanks very much uh, for that introduction. Um, this is, of course, a very important institution, a very special institution, one that was helpful to my work, and I'm uh, delighted to be here and delighted to be uh, joined uh, by Stan Norris, who, um, who's been very helpful to me in my scholarship. And I'm in another one of those special circumstances where many people in this room know more about this topic than I do. So I'm delighted to speak to uh, folks that are uh, experts on this matter and hear, uh, hear your perspectives as well. So in 1953, when Dwight Eisenhower became president, 
there were 841 nuclear weapons in the American arsenal. That's a specific number that we know now because of declassific declassification and declassified documents. When he left office eight years later, the U.S. nuclear arsenal numbered 18,686. Again, a specific and precise number that we know now because of declassified documents. Obviously, this is an enormous increase over a relatively short period of time. And it was in this period that the triad, the uh, three forms of strategic uh, delivery uh, systems came into being. And of course, those weapons and the, and the advent of the triad uh, has begat considerable historiography about how and why it is that the arsenal grew at the pace and developed into uh, three forms of of uh, delivery systems. But of the 18,686 weapons in the U.S. arsenal when Ike left office, 20 percent were allocated for anti-aircraft use over or near U.S. airspace. They were intended to be used against attacking Soviet bombers. This is a fact, not so much the percentage, but the fact the ubiquity of these weapons was well known at the time, but little remembered today, and largely absent from the historiography of the era. And that is the task, that is the subject that I turn myself to in the dissertation and this book. So today in discussing my work, I'm going to talk about the reasons for the development and the deployment of a substantial arsenal of nuclear anti-aircraft weapons in the United States. I'm going to talk about one individual and members of a particularly influential group who are especially visible and helpful in developing and deploying these weapons and setting their operational standards. And I'm going to recount a couple of interesting facets of the deployment of these weapons, which became apparent in the course of my research. Now, of course, in the early 1950s, the prospect of a surprise Soviet jet bomber nuclear attack was of considerable concern to U.S. policymakers. And each element of that phrase is significant. Surprise Soviet jet bomber nuclear attack. In the post-World War II era, airplanes were flying higher and faster. Jet engines uh, had been developed, which made average bomber speeds compared to those of World War II double. And cruising altitudes increased from 30,000 to 40,000 feet. No equipment has been devised which is satisfactory against jet-propelled aircraft, lamented an Army general to a congressional committee in 1949. 350 miles per hour seems to be the point at which we cease to be fully effective, he said. Guns, existing anti-aircraft guns at the time, were deemed to be inadequate. They could not assuredly destroy high-flying, fast-moving jet bombers. And equally importantly, they could not assuredly destroy the nuclear weapons that those planes were presumably carrying. From a defensive standpoint, if one were to damage an incoming uh, uh, bomber with a conventional gun or a conventional weapon of some sort, and that bomber was able to nonetheless loose its stores on the United States, from a defensive standpoint, the defensive situation has not been improved. Consequently, the United States government in this period sought what they called high-kill anti-aircraft alternatives. They sought weapons which offered the prospect of assuredly destroying attackers and the bombs they carried, even if those weapons only scored a near miss on the target. Again, guns firing rounds at, uh, at ballistic trajectories, which could not, the rounds obviously could not be guided, and high-flying, fast-moving bombers posed a defense challenge, presumably to the United States. Consequently, by 1951, there were various studies underway by the military services 
nuclear laboratories, defense contractors, all of which endorsed the concept of using a relatively small nuclear charge lofted into the altitude near an attacker to destroy the attacker and the bombs that they carried. But these various studies and, 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 and uh, uh, analysis concluded that this was only a prospective possibility. And the reason was because in the 19, early 1950s, the size and weight of existing missiles and planes meant that only the largest existing vehicles in U.S. inventory could carry nuclear weapons the necessary altitude and distance to be used for anti-aircraft purposes. In 1951, the smallest U.S. nuclear weapon was 23 feet long and weighed 5,000 pounds. But within two years, there were design and production advances which greatly reduced this size and weight. There were smaller and lighter weight assemblies and smaller uh, bomb assemblies themselves and smaller and more efficient high explosive components which weighed less. Sealed pit design, weapon designs came into being which also reduced the size and the weight of nuclear designs. And the tremendous increase in the availability of fissile material, an increase in production which had begun in Harry Truman's administration, consequently uh, came together to make nuclear anti-aircraft weapons possible. As a result, starting in 1957, the Air Force deployed 3,155 Genie-type air-to-air rockets, each carrying a two-kiloton nuclear warhead. They deployed them on scores of interceptor aircraft at 31 bases in 20 states. Later, an additional 1,900 Falcon-style, Falcon-named uh, 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 guided air-to-air -air missiles, each with a half-kiloton warhead, equipped some of these and other airplanes. The Army built small permanent launching facilities for 2,500 Army Nike Hercules surface-to-air missiles carrying two or 22 kiloton warheads at launch sites openly situa situated around 26 cities and 10 Air Force bases in 25 states. And the Air Force deployed its own surface-to-air missile, 409 of these Bomark longer-range missiles, each with a six and one-half ton uh, six and one-half kiloton warheads at eight launching sites in seven eastern and northeastern U.S. states and two locations in Canada. Now, the Falcon, the Air Force's guided uh, air-to-air -air missile, which was uh, deployed in 1961, illustrates the trajectory of the arms development uh, about which I spoke. First uh, 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 contemplated in 1957, when it was um, deployed, it was 15 inches long, I beg your pardon, the warhead, was 15 inches long, 11 inches in diameter, and weighed 50 pounds. Again, in a matter of years, nuclear weapons had gone from too big and too heavy for anti-aircraft use in seven years. They had become small enough, lightweight enough, sealed pit designs had come about, so that nuclear air-to-air -air weapons could be designed and deployed. Again, a, a, a typical a, a, a example, a weapon which typifies the weapon design trajectory of the time, it's directly relevant to the matter at hand. Now, the rationale for nuclear anti-aircraft design and deployment was a frequent topic of discussion at Eisenhower's White House, at National Security Council meetings within the Pentagon and elsewhere. And President Eisenhower was fully familiar and entirely supportive of the advent of these weapons. In a meeting with Admiral Radford, who chaired the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Eisenhower told him that while the use of atomic arms was a topic that, quote, calls for great care, close quote, he would certainly use air defense atomic weapons once available against any aircraft attacking the United States. He said that in 1956. Two years later at a press conference, the President said that the United States was endeavoring to make atomic arms, quote, useful in defensive purposes, such as shooting against a fleet of airplanes. In such cases, a nuclear device was more of a military weapon, he said, rather than one of just mass destruction. Later during the presidential election campaign, he issued a written statement on nuclear testing which echoed this point, and he asserted that re recent exercises have, quote, helped us to develop not primarily weapons for vaster destruction, but weapons for defense of our people against possible enemy attack. Now, there are many competing scholarly uh, assessments, some uh, advanced by folks in this room, about 
Ike's understanding of the development of strategic weapons during his administration and whether or not he uh, consciously uh, collaborated in the advent of the triad and the growth of the strategic arsenal, or whether or not other forces came into play and uh, he, he realized belatedly uh, what his administration had begun. But it's clear to me that Ike favored design and deployment of large numbers of nuclear anti-aircraft weapons. And my analysis of Ike's impressions of these weapons coexists with nearly every prevailing interpretation of Ike and strategic weapons. So understanding how President Eisenhower felt and the opinions he held on these arms doesn't tell us curiously much about what he thought about the strategic arsenal. Now, the president, as I said, was guided in, uh, in uh, uh, overseeing the design and deployment of, of uh, the nuclear air defense weapons by a particular inf in influential individual and then members of an advisory group which encouraged the rapid and widespread deployment of these arms. The individual was Robert Sprague, who was a Massachusetts uh, uh, electrical engineer and an industrialist. He was a Republican and a consultant to, um, to the Senate, who had been nominated by Ike as the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, but withdrew when it turned out that to accept the appointment would require giving up his corporate ownership in uh, uh, electrical components. As an alternative, the president appointed him as a Continental Defense Advisor to the National Security Council in 1954. And from that post, the non-paid advisory position which had him attending uh, uh, nearly all relevant NSC meetings, Robert Sprague persistently argued for the need for nuclear anti-aircraft arms and found a receptive audience in the president. Sprague was also, Robert Sprague was also the leader of the Technological Capabilities Panel, which was created by the President in 1954 and had the mandate, broad, broadly had the mandate, to, to determine ways in which technology could be applied to detecting, deterring, and defending against Soviet attack. And it was headed by MIT's President James Killian, is frequently known as the Killian Commission, it included 42 outside experts, in addition to Sprague, including Jimmy Doolittle, the famed World War II bomber pilot, and Edward Land, of course known as the inventor, among other things, of the Polaroid camera. After meeting and deliberating and considering the topic, the Killian Commission issued a lengthy two-volume report to the National Security Council in a long four-hour classified meeting in February 1955. Now, the report is best known for at, uh, has, has since become uh, well known for Ed Land's uh, uh, recommendation uh, in the codicil of the report for the development of the U-2 spy plane and the accompanying camera equipment that, that uh, went with the U-2. But the Killing Commission also urged the continued expeditious deployment of nuclear anti-aircraft arms. The report recommended that nuclear warheads qu become, quote, the major armament, close quote, from American air defense weapons. Nuclear weapons, the report said, are the most effective armament, armament with which we can equip our air defense forces. They provide the most direct and reliable method of achieving the high kill probability that modern air defense demands. The Killian Commission also urged two related uh, uh, recommendations. One is that the public be advised about the advent and deployment of nuclear air anti-aircraft uh, weapons, and that the public be informed about the extent to which U.S. nuclear design and testing activities were devoted to protective, what they called protective purposes. And the Killian Commission urged that the President grant pre-delegated nuclear use authority for these arms. And in fact, the Eisenhower administration heeded all the relevant recommendations of the Killian Commission. Let me talk about them for just a second. As to the public awareness, the Commission argued that the large number and the widespread prospective deployment of these weapons necessitated considerable public construction of facilities and uh, open deployment of the arms. Thus, they could not be kept secret. They also believe, the Commission also believed, that the putative defense benefits that these weapons offered 
or something that should be touted to the public. Consequently, in February 1957, one month after the Air Force's first uh, interceptors uh, carrying Genie rockets um, uh, uh, became operational in California, the President reviewed and approved a DOD press release which said, quote, the Department of Defense has begun deployment of nuclear weapons within the United States for air defense purposes. Nuclear air defense weapons now have been developed, which provide by far the most effective form of defense against air attack. It is essential to our national security that we incorporate these new weapons into our air defense system. They can destroy aircraft within a considerable distance from the point of burst, and employment of such weapons for air defense purposes will greatly enhance the effectiveness of interceptor squadrons and ground-based air defense units. The statement further said, elaborate precautions have been taken in the design and handling of these air defense weapons to minimize the harmful effects resulting from accidents either on the ground or in the air. Atomic weapons tests conducted by the Atomic Energy Commission have confirmed the possibility of any nuclear explosion occurring as a result of an accident involving either impact or fire is virtually non-existent. And the statement concluded that these weapons generally would be employed at altitudes where the effect of blast, heat, and radiation on the ground would be negligible. This, this announcement was um, widely uh, picked up in the media at the time. And subsequent announcements about deployments, uh, unit movements, and so forth, all were subject of, of, uh, of press accounts and press reports. Manufacture of these weapons ran ads touting their contributions to the nation's defense. Toys and model kits which replicated these, these weapons were offered to the public. Serial trading cards came equipped with uh, Nabisco uh, shredded wheat, or came in shredded wheat. DOD issued publicity films. Lassie visited a Nike Hercules site and was told that this was a defensive system that kept him and Timmy safe in their homes. All of this part of an intentional, conscious United States government effort consonant with the Killian Commission to advertise the putative benefit of these weapons and their widespread deployment. Now, there was another key promotional activity which was undertaken at Shot John in Operation Plum Bob in July of 1957 at the Nevada testing ground, uh, Nevada test site. At that time, in that operation, the Air Force fired an operational, not a test version, but an operational version of a genie at 18,000 feet above Yucca Flats at the Nevada test site. And five Air Force officer volunteers stood on the ground in shirt sleeves uh, uh, below the air zero point of the blast to demonstrate that these weapons could be used without harming civilians as, as intended. This effort earned considerable press coverage also. The New York Times said the next day that those on the ground said they experienced a sudden rush of air and a clap like thunder. The volunteers remained on the spot an hour after the detonation, the paper said, with Geiger counters, and they reported that radioactive fallout was almost undetectable. Time magazine described a fireball which gave way to a rosy donut-shaped cloud and noted that Genie's ability to destroy a whole flight of enemy bombers with the smash of its shock wave was an important advance. A wire service story explained that the volunteers wore only their regulation summer uniforms to prove that civilian populations could survive an overhead nuclear blast. So in this and other ways, the public became uh, well informed of, quite acclimated to the presence of nuclear uh, air defense weapons in their communities. There was broad public assent. The advent and operation of stateside Nike Hercules Army facilities was covered closely in local newspapers. Bay defense posts to get killer rockets, said the San Francisco Chronicle headline in January 1959. And the Milwaukee Journal reported in March of that year that the city's lakefront Nike base is now equipped to fire Nike warhead Hercules missiles. At least one city, there was disappointment that uh, they were unsuccessful in their effort to obtain nuclear anti-aircraft defenses. During and since Ed Johnson's term, of, term as governor, the Denver Post reported in late 1958, he's repeatedly urged the Defense Department to place Nikes in the Denver area. 
However, despite a hopeful headline, Nike bases for Denver called nearly certain, and a front page story, there were never any Nike Hercules batteries built in Colorado. Now, amidst this, there was scant opposition from what was then the nascent anti-nuclear movement. I don't mean to suggest, of course, that the anti-nuclear movement approved of the development and advent of these weapons, but it clearly demonstrates that they, too, knew of them and thought that the other weapons, the strategic arms, uh, even more plentiful and certainly more dangerous, is where their priorities should be focused. Now, the second topic that the Killing Commission broached was uh, uh, pre-delegation, pre-delegated use of the weapons. Before, of course, the advent of, of nuclear air defense weapons, the use of nuclear arms required specific presidential authorization. The Killian Commission argued, however, that the, the um, uh, circumstances of an attack, a surprise, sudden attack, and the attack itself, for that matter, might preclude or delay the actual authorization from Washington of the uh, permission to, to use nuclear arms in response, so nuclear defensive arms in response. So in April 1956, the President authorized the automatic use of air defense arms, nuclear air defense arms, in the event of unambiguous signs of nuclear attack on the U.S. And the book specifies exactly how it is that they define unambiguous signs. Now, this was intended to be a top secret instruction for, uh, I think, s uh, several obvious reasons. But the commander of the Air Force's Air Defense Command revealed it in 1957 to U.S. News and World Report and later to the New York Times, a year later to the New York Times. In 1957, in the course of the interview, the magazine asked uh, uh, General Earl Partridge, do you have to get the pre President's permission before using one of these atomic rockets? Yes, replied the General. However, the President has given his approval to use, without reference to anybody, any weapon at our disposal if there's a hostile aircraft in the system. U.S. News and World Report's transcription of the discussion said, uh, included the following exchange. So you don't have to wire Washington, they asked? No, he replied, we probably would be on the phone talking to people when the thing went off. In October 58, a year later, in an interview with the New York Times, General Partridge repeated much of what he had told U.S. News and World Report a year earlier. And the paper said, advanced permission to use these weapons had been granted because it was an inherent requirement of the defense mission. And it was assumed, at the Times explained, that the intention of an enemy attacker against the home soil could hardly be misinterpreted, and thus this required swift, powerful interception, an interception with nuclear arms. Now, the existence of pre-delegated use authority became an issue or, or um, uh, was a topic of discussion within the Pentagon during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We know, of course, uh, uh, the missile crisis uh, uh, primarily being the uh, discovery of intermediate range, uh, Soviet intermediate range ballistic missiles on the island and the, the possibility that they could attack the United States uh, from there. At the same time that the missiles were discovered, however, uh, American reconnaissance, U.S. reconnaissance flights discovered uh, a collection of Soviet IL-28 medium range Beagle bombers, which were nuclear capable and uh, capable of carrying uh, uh, nuclear arms. And within the Pentagon, there was fear of a Soviet bomber attack from Cuba on the southeastern United States. Now, of course, when the original defense preparations had been undertaken uh, in the Eisenhower administration, there had never been a contemplation of an attack from from Cuba or from the south. And obviously, the, the distribution and the construction for the uh, uh, um, interceptors and missile sites all were in locations that were, that were focused on a uh, attack from over the poles or over the coasts. So the discovery of a potential threat from Cuba required the Air Force to uh, quickly move interceptors to uh, the southeastern United States and be prepared for what they saw as the prospect of a beagle attack from Cuba. But there were no Nike Hercules sites anywhere in the vicinity of uh, anywhere in the southeastern United States, certainly not in Florida. And so the Army ordered the sole rail mobile unit, uh, the only Nike Hercules unit that was not physically uh, in place at a, at a permanent uh, facility elsewhere in the United States, to move by rail and to establish temporary defenses around the Miami area. 
In the course of this move, the NORAD commander asks the Joint Chiefs of Staff about the pre-delegated authority that has been granted to him. He notes that it's possible, in his telegram to the JCS, that it, he notes that it's possible but uncommon to fit the Nike Hercules with a conventional high-explosive warhead. But he reminds them that the standard procedure is that it is a nuclear weapon which carries a nuclear warhead and that he has pre-delegated authority to use it in the event of unambiguous Soviet attack. Rules and engagement for the Florida area prescribe the use of high explosive weapons only, he tells them in a telegram which Michael Dobbs found in the course of researching his very fine book, One Minute to Midnight. The general says, in the event of an IL-28 raid from Cuba which penetrates U.S. airspace, I consider it imperative to use weapons with the maximum kill capability. Sink NORAD employs nuclear weapons and air defense within the sovereign boundaries of the United States, is authorized to deploy them to employ them. He requests clarification of my authority to declare a Cuban Sino-Soviet tactical aircraft hostile and to use nuclear weapons. Your attention is invited, he says, to the fact that in most cases, Nike Hercules units have no, repeat, no high explosive warheads in their emplacements in the United States. Now, you have to read the book to get the whole story. This causes a <laughs> enormous flurry of activity at, uh, at the war room at, at, uh, within the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Again, the, 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 the standard practice, standard procedure is, to is that the nuclear anti-aircraft arms are deployed. The standing order is to use them in the event of unambiguous Sino-Soviet uh, Sino attack. And now they're confronted with the possibility that, in fact, they might have to actually use a weapon in the event of such an attack. And General Gerhardt is asking to confirm that, in fact, those are his instructions. As it turns out, the, uh, th there's a, a flurry of activity within the, uh, within the war room, and th there are uh, special arrangements made to ensure that the Nike Hercules unit, which is moving by rail and establishing uh, defenses of Miami, uh, carries will carry only conventional uh, versions of the Nike Hercules. There are not many of them, and they have to scour uh, armories nationwide to to uh, assemble enough to send to them. I'm sure that there's actually others uh, others uh, 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 prepared, and they make it quite clear. The JCS makes it quite clear that they intend to use to to authorize to 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 allow the authority to use nuclear weapons to apply only in the case of a broader attack against the country, not merely a raid from Cuba, regardless of whether or not that raid from Cuba may be one involving nuclear weapons. Now, lest you think this um, leads to a permanent revision of the Army policy or uh, 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 lasting reconsideration of pre-delegated uh, use or uh, reconsideration of the need, in fact, for nuclear anti-aircraft weapons at all, in fact, that's not true. When the Cuban uh, crisis abates, uh, the intermediate-range uh, missiles go away. The temporary unit sent, uh, the temporary Nike Hercules unit sent to Miami uh, is established in permanent facilities built uh, around the Miami area for them, and they receive nuclear rounds uh, just as any other uh, permanently constructed battery in the United States does, and their uh, procedures uh, mirror those of, of all the other batteries. So, in conclusion, let me, just, let me just ask this question. So, did the U.S. nuclear anti-bomber defenses matter to the Soviet Union? Nikita Khrushchev said in his memoirs that American anti-aircraft preparations had been on his mind during his tenure. He noted that the performance characteristics of the primary Soviet bomber meant it, quote, would have been shot down long before it got anywhere near its target. Now, I argue briefly in the book that that could have been a genuine assessment of Khrushchev's. could also have been a self-serving declaration to describe after the fact, or to explain after the fact, why it is that the Soviet leadership appeared to put their development and research energies towards strategic missiles rather than air-breathing bombers. But, and in fact, as David Holloway and others have shown, uh, the Soviets did put their energies, did intentionally made a conscious decision to steer away from, from uh, manned bombers. 
and to field instead a force of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So it was 30 years that the United States had nuclear anti-aircraft arms in its inventory, and they were ultimately uh, withdrawn for several reasons over uh, a decade or so. As I said, it became apparent that intercontinental ballistic missiles and not bombers were the threat. In addition, anti-aircraft technology improved to the extent that military leaders believed that they could assuredly destroy targets, high-flying jet bomber targets with conventional warheads. And the cost, the financial cost and the manpower demands of the Vietnam era made the continued maintenance and staffing of missile sites and interceptors crude and remain, maintained on alert very difficult. So starting in 1953, each of the four types of the U.S. nuclear weapons were gradually withdrawn. The final genie, the final Air Force air-to-air -air guided nuclear rocket was retired from the inventory in 1986. This ended the deployment of a significant class of nuclear weapons and ended the story of how it is that 20 percent of the U.S. nuclear arsenal in the Eisenhower years became a little-known historical curiosity. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christopher Bright takes us back to a time when the Cold War was in full swing. The Russians had set off an atomic bomb in 1949. The Korean War broke out the next year. Atomic spies, Klaus Fuchs and the Rosenbergs, seemed everywhere. And now worse, soon after the Eisenhower administration took office in August 1953, the Russians apparently exploded a hydrogen bomb. In Red Square, there were bomber flyovers and flyovers during parades po posing new threats to the United States with projections of increasing numbers in the years ahead. Christopher captures well the anxiety of the era. Unimaginable destruction could result if those bombers got through and bombed American cities. The U.S. was now faced with the ruthless global foe. Communism had replaced fascism, and Stalin replaced Hitler. One response was continental air defense, and Chris's book is superb in filling in the heretofore missing chapters of the early nuclear era. The research is thorough. He has read everything official histories, archival documents, the entire secondary literature, PhD dissertations, and even a master's thesis here and there. The Eisenhower years are ones of enormous growth in the nuclear stockpile. The numbers are dramatic, as he said. We now have official figures for the entire period, from 1945 to 2010. The numbers from 1962 to the present were supplied by the Pentagon last on, on May 3rd. This growth was <clears throat> the result of several factors. Enormous enthusiasm for nuclear weapons by each of the armed services, the Air Force, Navy, Army, and Marines. Each service sought a nuclear weapon for almost every military mission, whether it made much sense or not. Just as an aside, when the co-authors of the Brookings book that came to be Atomic Audit were trying to find a good title, one of my choices was it seemed like a good idea at the time. Also fueling the growth was a new design laboratory, Lawrence Livermore, which set off a competition and stimulus with Los Alamos beyond the inter-service rivalry within the Pentagon. There were technological advances, <coughs> advances in designing smaller diameter, lighter weight warheads and bombs. All of this peaked at the end of the Eisenhower administration with over 7,000 new warheads produced in 1959 and another 7,000, over 7,000, again in 1960. 20 new warheads a day. Chris covers all of the issues from safety to pre-delegation and introduces some interesting characters. He rescues Robert Sprague from obscurity. Uh, I wonder why his papers are still closed. I enjoyed Barney Oldfield's role, and I'm sorry the TV series was never made. I have to read the book here, too. Uh, one interesting theme that he follows is the public relations campaign <clears throat> campaigns that surround the introduction of these weapons into the lives of the American public. Films, briefings, displays, trading cards in Nabisco shredded wheat, plastic models. 
I guess you only have the box and not the missile, and maybe on eBay you can get the missile. And press releases to calm the public's fears. Uh, my favorite was <clears throat> one describing tests at Nevada as friendly blasts offering, offering comforting protection, close quote. Language worthy of the madmen of the time. That was a double entendre for, for those of you who are not watching the series on cable. Okay. There are significant new findings <clears throat> um, as detailed descriptions of Operation Snodgrass and Opera Hat, um, espionage cases uh, surrounding Nike Hercules were, were new to me. Uh, the procedures during the C Cuban Missile Crisis were, were quite interesting. Uh, I should add that my colleague at NRDC was in the Army National Guard in October 1973 during the Yom Kippur War and the Watergate Crisis. Uh, when President Nixon ordered a worldwide alert in response to a threat that the Soviet Union might intervene in the Middle East, my friend was hauled out of bed and went to a site north of Baltimore where, he tells me, uh, the doors opened and the Nike Hercules missiles were raised to a vertical position. Uh, another interesting um, um, uh, description is uh, of uh, a potential test in the Pacific called Blue Straw uh, in 1962 where the Air Force sought to conduct uh, live fire tests of Genie and Falcons. <clears throat> As he says, the entire panoply of continental defense is not covered in the book. There is much room for other articles and books to be written to include a history of the Pine Tree Line at the 49th parallel, the Mid-Canada Line at the 55th parallel, and the Dew Line at the 70th parallel. Also, there are the Navy picket ships, uh, civil defense for the population, and continuity of government exercises for the leadership. Chris does describe four Operation Alert exercises during the Eisenhower administration. Just to fill out the picture, the U.S. undertook an extensive air defense mission in the Pacific and in Europe. The Nike Hercules was deployed to Hawaii, Alaska, Okinawa, Guam, Korea, and to NATO for Greek, Italian, and Dutch, <clears throat> Belgian, and U.S. units in West Germany. The Falcon was deployed to Alaska, Hawaii, Canada, Okinawa, the Philippines, and to Spain and West Germany. The mo the Beaumark and Genie, of course, went to Canada. Mention of the Kansas City construction firm of Black and Veatch jumped out at me. They were contracted by the Army Corps of Engineers to build Genie storage facilities. The original atomic weapons storage program, under the code name Water Supply, was planned and begun under the Manhattan Engineer District, commanded by Major General Leslie R. Groves. Of of the Army Corps of Engineers. General Groves initiated the project early in 1946, and prospective sites were surveyed. He chose Black and Veitch, 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 to oversee the building of the facilities. Three initial locations were designated Site A, B, and C, and a separate area of an existing at an excess at an existing at a separate area of an existing military installation. Manzano Base at Kirtland Air Force was the first storage site to be built, Site A, due to its proximity to Los Alamos <coughs> Laboratory, where nuclear weapons were initially produced. Uh, construction began in 1946 at Colleen Base, Fort Hood. Uh, the second site, Site B, and Site C was Clarksville Base at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, <coughs> these three and three more uh, were labeled National uh, Stockpile Sites, NSS. Uh, they were later supplemented by other sites called Operational Storage Sites. <clears throat> One reason why I like the book so much is that the research methodology is much like my own. Using Bob Woodward's advice to follow the money, uh, my approach has always been to follow the bomb. And I f have found that it pays dividends. Ask basic questions. Where are the bombs? Where are they deployed? How many are there? What are their yields? What is their testing record? Uncovering FRD has been my research agenda, and it is not surprising that Chris has followed this path with a dissertation committee that included uh, Jim Hirschberg and Bill Burr. I would just add that the Public Interest Declassification Board held a public hearing in July 
to decide whether to declassify historically significant FRD. Steve Aftergood, Bill Burr, and I testified, and you can probably guess what we recommended. In that same spirit, Chris extensively used Chuck Hansen's papers at the National Security Archive, and I am sure that Chuck would be pleased that he helped, produce, helped in producing such a fine book. Just a couple of things in closing, uh, tiny details. You say there were genies in Greenland. Uh, Appendix D to the DOD custody and deployment history does not show that, but that's not the only discrepancy. Um, I would have liked an appendix with a list of where the weapons were deployed, especially the Nike Hercules units. Um, and I often close at, um, with, with something that we wrote in an atomic audit. Um, we, we now have a picture of the entire stockpile, and we think that the overall number was probably about 70,000 uh, nuclear weapons that were built. But, uh, of course, that was uh, just how things turned out. And uh, along the way, there were other expectations and possibilities. At one, de one end of the scale, we say, the Army's Lieutenant General James Gavin, Deputy Chief of Staff for Research and Development under General Maxwell Taylor, to told, the Joint Chiefs <clears throat> told the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy in 1956 and 57 that the total requirement for the Army alone would be 151,000 nuclear weapons, 106,000 for tactical battlefield use, 25,000 for air defense, and 20,000 for support of our allies. Gavin estimated that a typical field army might use a total of 423 atomic warheads in one day of intense combat, not including surface-to-air weapons. Anyway, the point is that um, all of the figures that uh, Chris cited are ones that could have been much larger or much smaller, and it's interesting to try and determine how, how it worked out to be the way it was. So um, that is all I have to say, and uh, congratulations on a very fine book. Thank, thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, unless do you want to say a couple of words? Do you want to respond to anything? Or do you just, no, no, let's okay. go right ahead. Okay, so uh, please wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself. That would be great. Let's just start there. Hugh McElrath, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, I guess because of where I'm from, I should ask, you know, were, the, were they um, uh, plutonium or uh, uranium bombs, yeah, if that's known in, in the unclassified realm? Uh, but my real question has to do with, you know, we've been exercised for a long time about high-altitude electromagnetic pulse effects. Now, usually that's much higher than the altitudes that you're talking about for air defense purposes, but were there manifestations either in the testing or some <laughs> studies done that you're aware of? That's an excellent question. Um, first of all, um, they were all plutonium weapons. Michael, am I right about that? They're all plutonium weapons. I think weapons. so, yeah. No, yeah. No, no. And, and um, electromagnetic pulse was not... Um, Understood until Dominic, in 1960, in 1962, uh, very high altitude. Right, and so at very high altitudes, and there was um, no consideration that I saw of electromagnetic pulse before 1962. And when there was a discovery of it at high altitude, I think there was a decision made, or it appears to be a decision made, that it wasn't applicable at the altitudes we were talking about with weapons of this size. Right, right, right. Michael Binder, Air Force Declassification Office. The Navy had a very relatively slight role when it came to North American air defense. They had one fighter squadron in San Diego. Um, but I'm wondering, did they volunteer any of their uh, ships with surface-to-air missiles like Talos with a nuclear warhead? For example, when they're in port that they could help defend the coast? you know anything about Not it? Not that I know of. In fact, the, Ar the Air Navy spent most of the time that they were involved in the Continental Defense Mission trying to get out of the Continental Defense Mission. Um, so, <laughs> <Typical> so, Navy. <laughs> so um, I, I never saw any documents to that effect. And as you know, there was a short-lived competition 
uh, to uh, make Talos, uh, Talos a, a ground-based weapon instead of uh, uh, Hercules, and, and that was caught up in some inter-service rivalry. But um, I've never seen any indication that the um, Navy was prepared either close in or in port. Okay, and another question. Did you ever see anything about using a bomb as an air-to-air -air weapon? They didn't go that far, Michael. Well, yes. Okay, huh? okay. Well, so new one on me. At, at the Seemed very, like a good at, idea at, at the time. At, <laughs> at the very <laughs> early um, contemplations, hypothetical, you know, early 1951 study uh, that I was speaking of, where um, uh, the Air Force Special Weapons Project kind of considered how this might operate, and they talked about almost a bomber aircraft bombing a lower flying aircraft in a, in a theoretical sense. I mean, they were talking about this pilot wouldn't work but if, because of the size and weight, but this would be the sort of thing you'd have to do. So Rand in the mid-50s did a study with an F-84 and a Mark 7 bomb, and they were actually plotting out what kind of a trajectory, and it's going to be like toss bombing right. as I'm an air-to-air -air weapon against fleets of bombers or whatever. I'm not surprised to know that. All the 54 sounds a little late for that, but I'm not surprised. Well, it's still about three years before you have a genie, so everybody that, wants to get in on the action. Let me, um, and I, I, I think I probably should have mentioned that um, at the beginning of this. Um, our partners at the National Security Archive, together with, with uh, Chris, uh, put together a, a wonderful collection of documents on this very subject. You can you can um, head over to the National Security Archives uh, website, or you can come to our website, and we have a link on 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 the event announcement for today that will send you straight to their website, and, and you can see uh, a lot of those documents. I also have a question for you, and and um, I'm I'm sure you've asked it. As, Knowing the people on your committee, I'm sure you've you've been asked this, um, and it was uh, maybe it was in the dissertation. You didn't mention it in your presentation, so I'm, I'm going to ask you now. Um, was there a similar program on the Soviet side, and what do we know about this, this Soviet uh, uh, program? There was a um, a uh, nearly equivalent um, Soviet program. I can't speak to the extent of deployment. And I learned, uh, I guess, a week ago at uh, a think tank presentation, and I can't think if it was Carnegie Down, but I was at a couple different places last week, but uh, one of the speakers said that they, they remain uh, in the Soviet inventory. Uh, Anti-aircraft, not, not, not the anti-missile. They said that they conceded those also, but they said the Soviets, I uh, beg your pardon, the Russians continue to field um, oh, service to air no nuclear doubt. missiles. But I, don't, I don't think they ever had any air-to-air, -to, -air, to my knowledge. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, huh? correct. For interceptors? I don't, I, I don't think that's... Attacking American bombers? Uh, correct. I, no, no, I meant to suggest uh, uh, mm -hmm. surface to air. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the... Um, Can the, you identify yourself? Sorry, Tim McDonald. I work at the center. Um, can you talk a little bit about the um, the Bomark versus the the Hercules? Um, it seems like the Nike Hercules missile was uh, deployed in vastly larger numbers than the Bomark. Um, it seems, at least retrospectively, a little bit unusual or counterintuitive for the Army to have such a um, such an important role in defending against air attack. Um, but they seem to have through um, by hook or by crook, have gotten the mission largely away from the Air Force. Um, can you talk about this a little bit, how it worked? Sure. There was a early policy decision uh, assigning, uh, uh, distinguishing between what was considered point defense and area defense, and point defense of a ground target, <laughs> a specific discrete uh, piece of contiguous territory, was assigned to the Army, and broader um, defense of a, of a region was assigned to the Air Force, and that was a specific, uh, as a result of, of, uh, of uh, inter-service rivalry and, 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 and disagreement about whether or not one service should do it all, there was a decision to divide it in that way. Um, the Bomark missile was an enormously complicated um, ramjet-powered um, uh, missile guided uh, in flight by um, 
well, so was it like Hercules, but 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 guided, interconnected with the semi-autonomous ground environment system, the Sage system, um, because of its the, how complicated and complex it was, it was very late to be deployed. Now, again, the nuclear charge part was relatively simple and balanced against uh, uh, other nuclear uh, weapon developments. Um, but it was delayed in its deployment because of uh, problems in other aspects of the weapon, not the nuclear charge. And because, as you, as you point out, um, it was deployed later, uh, just at the time when there was a uh, budget stringency brought to the Department of Defense, like Hercules already was well advanced in its deployment schedule, and so there was a tussle, but ultimate resolution, both by the Congress and, and the President, to settle on the deployment scheme that primarily had Nike Hercules and, uh, and uh, much less on the Bomark. Um, I'll say just this about the Bomark, sort of like the Navy getting out from the um, Continental Defense Mission, it appears that the uh, Air Force uh, rapidly lost interest in the Mo Bomark even after they had it. The first sites were uh, closed within, I think, five years of, of being opened. Um, and those that remained uh, uh, rotated uh, shipping a operational missile without the warhead, of course, to the Florida Panhandle for for uh, test Our, shots for the, for, the, for, the, for the crew to, to practice uh, shooting a missile. Uh, using drawing down, obviously, a, a finite number of missiles that were deployed. So it seems to me that the Air Force wasn't too concerned about husbanding their resources and... But initially, in, in, in terms of enthusiasm, I think, uh, Chris can correct me here, I think the Bomark originally, they wanted a, a lot more missiles. 10,000, 10, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Another thing I forgot to mention that uh, uh, surrounding the Bomark is um, uh, a description of uh, one of the 32 nuclear weapon accidents of Broken Arrow, a uh, Bomark in New Jersey, which is um, a pretty bad one, actually, because the plutonium caught on fire here and... Uh, made quite a mess, and, um, uh, but anyway, they're just another uh, part of the uh, air defense story. Yes, right. Uh, hold, hold just one second, Sorry. please. For the... Stephen Schwartz. There we go. Technology. <clears throat> Stephen Schwartz with the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, but for the purposes of this discussion, the editor and co-author of Atomic Audit with several fine people in the room. Um, I Just to bring up to date one of the things you uh, uh, said um, that we wrote about in the book, um, by 1965, 34% of the U.S. stockpile was for air defense. And in all of the 70,000 warheads that we built, about 16% were fair defense. It was a really, really, really substantial investment, and I'm, I'm glad you unearthed all of it. Um, Stan mentioned just in passing the, the flyovers, the May Day parades. I'm just wondering, it's sort of counterintuitive, but we have some historians in the room. If there hadn't been the bomber gap, if we hadn't, I mean, there probably would have been other things going on. Certainly there would have been inter-service rivalry. But if there hadn't been a bomber gap that allowed the Air Force and the Air Power Coalition in Congress to pursue these things as uh, energetically as they did. Would this program have been as absurd as it was? Mm. In 10 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear Stan on this too, but let me, let, me, let me say I suspect so. And the reason is is because um, there was – um, the, the White House was seared by the prospect of a nuclear Pearl Harbor. And that fear um, was not particularly that, – that, that fear took root long before there were specific numbers attached to any um, Soviet bombers and before um, – well, b before there were e even contemplations of, of large numbers or the estimates of large numbers of Soviet bombers. So I suspect – um, that the – even absent the, um, the bomber gap, that there would have been a deployment that looked an awful lot like this. And, and I, I've got the exact number in the, in the, in the book, but the U-2 – the first U-2 overflight was of a bomber base. 
I think the third and fourth were also bomber bases, and that was, and then they switched to missile sites. And there's this discussion at the NSC where they say, okay, so the U-2 has shown that the bomber bases aren't as, um, there are not as many bombers on the bases as we anticipated, but there will be no need to return to the, to, to, to the, to the bomber bases to, to overfly them. Um, so we're looking now at, at, at the strategic missiles. Uh, again, showing that there was a, um, the absence of evidence uh, only confirmed that the evidence was forthcoming uh, uh, yet. So, so I don't, um, I think it would have continued in much the same way. Do you want to? Stan, did you want to? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, just does a very good job of capturing the sort of anxiety of the era here and that uh, just uh, the ignorance about uh, this new foe that uh, set off an atomic bomb and now a hydrogen bomb. And, and uh, you know, that just drove everything, and no, no congressman wanted to be weak on things, so let's... Uh, you know, there are numerous reasons why they would give uh, money to things and, you know, whatever the system would bear. I mean, and it, it could have been half that size. It could have been double that, five times that size. But it worked out to be what it was and uh, uh, driven by a host of factors, uh, not least of which were um, to show strength, to calm the fears of the American public and... and um, um, to, to return to that era is, uh, I think he does a very good job at showing the, the, the whole context of uh, what the drivers here. Can I just follow up? Just, Mike. I can speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, the, the, web. Yeah, the webcast is uh, not going to pick it up. As well, for all those people out there. So, so here's a question. You've, you've shown, and I'll, I'll, when I finish the book, I'll get the full flavor of it, but that the government really made an all out effort to persuade, I love that press release, persuade people that this was fine and dandy and nothing to worry about. And apparently people didn't object. So why did everything change with the ABM system proposed by Johnson and then Nixon? Why did why were there suddenly people up in arms saying, Don't I don't want nukes in my backyard? What what happened? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It goes beyond no, no, what you No, no, said. but that's an excellent question, and that's the chapter that wasn't written. In other words, that, 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 that's an excellent question, and you're right. Within six or seven years, in the exact same locations where there were headlines that said, um, uh, uh, desired weapons arriving, uh, 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 cheers erupt, are, are objections as if um, um, uh, objections to the presence. And, and the, answer is, the answer is Vietnam. I mean, the answer is, is the, 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 the tumult uh, uh, which upended um, perspectives on the military, perspectives on uh, assurances of safety, um, which injected a enormous skepticism across society. I, I think I'd go earlier and, and um, sh talk about the, uh, the public's concern about uh, nuclear weapon testing in the atmosphere. There's fallout, and it's going to get into the milk and everything, and then there's this global demand to stop testing, which Ike jumps aboard, and uh, he's going to have the moratorium, which interferes with some things. And then, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, some of the American public are putting two and two together here, that uh, they've got uh, battalions and batteries of uh, air defense weapons that are going to go off right, right on top of them. I mean, I, that's always just mystified me that so willingly they went along with this and, I don't know, never put two and two together, but maybe finally they did. Maybe Tom Lehrer helped along in, in, in the process, too. <laughs> yeah, back there. Michael Bender of the Air Force. Chris, can you give me some views about Eisenhower? In January 61, before he leaves office, he warns about the military-industrial complex, and yet in the previous eight years, we saw nuclear weapons enter almost every single environment in which we had any kind of weapons. Surface to air, air to air, air to ground, ship to air, air to ship. Submarine, Only yeah, anti-satellite, I think didn't happen during his time. What does it say about him? Someone who was so afraid of a nuclear accident causing nuclear war, and yet he's pushing, and he has to sign for this personally. He's pushing thousands of warheads into every possible environment and into foreign countries where U.S. control is limited. 
I, I, I agree. I mean, I, you know, somehow Eisenhower gets depicted as, oh, this, you know, general comes out of World War II. He's going to uh, <laughs> get those uh, generals and admirals in line here. And then they're running rampant. I mean, and really, they don't begin to be put on a shorter leash until, you know, McNamara comes in. And, and uh, you can't have 10,000 ICBMs, general power. I'm sorry. We'll have 1,000, and you'll be okay with that. I'm sorry, Admiral, you can't have 100 submarines. You're only going to have 41 or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, I, I agree. I mean, there's this kind of disconnect between Eisenhower, who's supposed to be the one guy because he's won World War II, uh, who's going to shape up the Pentagon, and they're, and they're running wild. I mean, there's 7,000 per year in, in his last two years. Uh, it, it was good that he warned, though, it, 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 on the way out the door. And, um, you know, we still refer to that. But uh, he didn't do much to uh, keep him in line. And it, it's a mystery here as to this other image of him sort of is out there, but it's faulty to some degree, to a major degree. And again, the fascinating thing to me is that, is that to the extent that he realized late that he had presided over um, – and the expansion of an, uh, the greater expansion of the arsenal than he had intended or had consciously directed. He's very specific that his criticisms are not lodged against air defense weapons. There's a briefing late in the administration. He gets um, whatever the contemporary equivalent PowerPoint was. You know, he's leafing through these slides, and it's got um, uh, weapon summaries and so forth. And he. Um, I think marks on some of them or sends a subsequent memo um, about his objections So why do we need this, this is duplicative and, and so forth. He doesn't say a single thing about the Hercules, the Falcon, the Genie. And I think the Beaumark was in the, in the same briefing too. He's got lots of things to say. And again, you, that's reading a negative. It's not necessarily to say that he um, assented to every aspect of it, but when asked to proffer his comments on these various subjects, he didn't have much to say about their defense weapons. Yeah, right back there. Uh, Hugh McElrath from PNNL again. Um, since you opened the door about it, uh, w one thing I would suggest as, a, as an answer, nobody asked me, but uh, I think nuclear weapons were seen as more cost effective than conventional forces. And so that you know, you could sometimes substitute nukes for big conventional forces. Um, but my question is, uh, you kind of opened the door to, to Eisenhower's style. So here, here he was, a former Supreme Allied Commander, former Chief of Staff of the Army. Did, was his approach to defense policy, it has to have been, different, but different in in process, did he participate in uh, tabletop war games? W was he more intimately involved in the development of strategy than other commanders in chief before or after? Well, I think there's some historiographical debate about um, Ike as management style. Certainly, there's a there's been a uh, revision of what. Historians say they know about I once papers became declassified. I'll say only this that it's it's clear from the material I looked at, material on this topic. Eisenhower was actively, intimately, um, directly engaged in matters at hand. I mean, you know, long briefings about uh, uh, weapons, uh, deployment schedules, procedures, you know, pre delegation, whatever. He's actively engaged in these, uh, or so the records make the, make it appear. Uh, so so so, um, which which from from the perspective of doing this book was very helpful and very good. In other words, to know that at the senior most levels, the president himself was contemplating and discussing these weapons helps to round out the story. It's not something that happened at a level below him, and uh, uh, you know it was presented to him. He's actively engaged on these topics, and and. Uh, and um, obviously, there's a broad literature about the way he 
um, organized his national security bureaucracy, the national security uh, 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 council staff, and so forth, and, and the use of these various outside commissions, the killing commission, only one of a couple of high-profile groups he impaneled. So, so there's a lot to be said about uh, about his management style and uh, and uh, the extent of his engagement in the process. And I just think uh, your, your point is well taken about the cost, because, I mean, that's how he presented, uh, you know, that's why we got into NATO in such a big way here. We're going to have, yeah, and, and the new but, but look me, and all of this that, stuff. That's true, that's true, Stan, but however, um, I never saw the justification that we need, the, the justification for the nuclear air defense arms were because they would assuredly destroy attacking planes and their uh, bombs they carried, not that they were less expensive than the alternative. But at least, uh, I mean, we've got this formidable Warsaw Pact in, the, in Europe here, and uh, nuclear weapons are going to save us money because we can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them with such huge uh, armies No, no, I agree, that, I agree that the... So th that was only my point. So nuclear weapons fill a void there and, and are advertised as cost-saving, which was your point, which I agree with. Agree. No, no, I agree with that. All right, well, let me uh, thank both of you for... Thank for you. The comments and the presentation, and and uh, recommend that you guys pick up a book outside, and you guys out on the web, pick up a book at your local bookstore or online. Um, again, thank thank you all, and uh, uh, we'll see you at another event. Okay, thank you.